Uh, welcome, welcome to our panel on solidarity within the university. This morning, we talked about how to build bridges beyond. Today, we're going to try to get, this afternoon, we're going to try to get a little more micro on what this is going to look like when and if the man, man, our management forces us to withhold our labor. So I'm going to give you a real brief rundown of why we are preparing to go on strike. Uh, if you have a lot of questions about that, this is not really the space, and you can find me or other people, and we could definitely talk about that. We just want to set up the logic, and then we're going to have a wonderful panel of your colleagues and comrades come up to talk about the how of the strike, right? What would that really look like? All right. So uh, we are part of a movement that's going on all over the country right now. It's not just academic labor like we saw this morning, but it includes academic labor. We've had strikes at NYU, New School, UC, U Illinois, American University, Temple ongoing, solidarity with our Temple grad workers. And look at these wage gains. This is not a joke. 57%, 40%, 20%, 18, 10, right? And I'm not a statistician, but you know, there seems to be maybe some anecdotal correlation between length of strike and amount of wage gain. Not 100%, it's not 100% correlation, but just something to think about. So this is what we're a part of. This is not just about Rutgers, this is about academic labor and the working class nationwide and globally. All right, this is a moment. Oh, thanks, Jacob. All right, this is what we're demanding. Our analysis of the university is that it's been uh, profit-centered. It's a public institution, that's not right, but that is how they're behaving. They are uh, bloating their management ranks. They're throwing hundreds of millions of dollars into athletics. They are uh, keeping workers in precarious wage conditions. They are enhancing their own control, taking control away from workers and students. There are pervasive inequities between, between the three campuses. A lot of people don't even know there are three campuses. They just assume it's just New Brunswick. Well, it's not, right? Where are we right now? That's right. And they're running it like a corporation. And so instead, we have our people-centered vision. This is the contract fight that we're in right now. We're demanding salary improvements, elimination of the fiscal emergency provision, which is a little wonky. But what it is is that during the pandemic, they had the right to say they didn't have enough money to pay us our raises. Oh, no. Exactly. And we fought them on it. We bargained on it. We won those raises back. But we don't trust them to use that provision anymore. We want that out of the contract. All right. We want job security for our workers. Equal pay for equal work. Equal pay for equal work, right? We want pathways to tenure, longer contracts, reclassification, talk to your faculty, they'll give you all the nitty gritty on what this means. It means job security for the people that work at Rutgers so that the students in Rutgers can count on having people who are here who can afford to stick around for you. We want faculty governance and worker agency. We don't want Rutgers canceling classes just because they think they need to cancel the class, right? We want to have a say in that. Uh, we want equity raises for Camden and Newark and abolishing this fiscal, fisc, uh, fictional debt that Camden has been uh, layered with. And I'll talk a bit about why that is in a minute. And we want bargaining for the common good of our students and our community members. Who's ready to fight for this? All right, we gotta go way back though. I'm a historian, we gotta go way back. How did we get here? Rutgers was founded as a private liberal arts colonial college. It's as old as some of the Ivy League universities and it's still got that in its DNA. It wasn't until after World War II that it became the State University of New Jersey and we're still fighting to make it the actual State University of New Jersey. So the legacy of this is the inequities we see between the campuses. Newark and Camden didn't get absorbed until after World War II and they're still treated like the stepchildren of the university, right? And there's inequities between groups of students and workers between the campuses, also on each campus. But the other legacy and response to this history is students and workers fighting for social justice. Two core examples, 1969, the black student takeover of this building, Conklin Hall. And 1972, one of the first faculty unions in the country. And so our union holds a lot of clout. Us going on strike is not just about us. Us going on strike is about a legacy academic workers union standing up. 
and leading the way. We need to lead on this. We are so lucky. You talk to colleagues in other universities, they are un unevenly unionized. A lot of groups of workers aren't unionized. We are wall to wall unions at Rutgers. We got to use that. All right, just a real quick refresher if you're new to the party. This is who we are. We got a lot of alphabet soup, A, U, P, A, F, T. That represents the full-time, part-time faculty, grad workers, as well as our healthcare uh, uh, academic colleagues. 8,000 workers across all three campuses. URA is our administrative workers. They actually like just keep the bills and everything running. They're the ones that help you register for your classes. We've got UCAN. Where's UCAN at? Ah, right. These are our comrades across the street. This is a good example. They have unionized much more recently than us, right? So we're trying to bring them along with us and they're being great comrades. Uh, and then we have CREW, our coalition of Rutgers Union, 19 locals representing 20,000 Rutgers employees. And then we've got Rutgers One, obviously. So that brings together undergraduate alumni and all stakeholders. So this is the group of people that need to shut this university down. All right, but who are we fighting? Yo, we're fighting this labyrinth of administrators. And I know you can't read these, that's not the point. The point is there's so many of them and there's so many little names and boxes on the hillside made of ticky tacky, right? If you're older, you get that reference. Oh. All right. Um, so the point of showing this is just to show you how labyrinthine the management structure is. These boxes are multiplying. These boxes are getting raises. And even though we have all these boxes who are like the deans and the chancellors, the board of governors up top who ran scared from us today, <laughs> the people that actually run the university are these guys over here all the way on the right. This is the C-suite, meaning CFO, CEO, the C's. These are carryovers from the last administration. If you were not here, Holloway is the new guy. We had Robert Barchi before that. He was not a friend of organized labor. Yeah, boo. Right? So when Holloway started, there was some hope that there would be a change. You know, Holloway talks a big game because he's a civil rights historian. <laughs> yeah, not boo for all civil rights historians, but for that one. Um, so we thought maybe there'd be a change. Holloway kept all the same people on. All the same guys are making the same decisions over in the C-suite. And a lot of these guys are actually Chris Christie appointees. If you are So that's who we're fighting. Holloway is just the new figurehead. But interestingly, the person we actually fight at the bargaining table is not even on this chart. This is my favorite part. This is Christie's chart. This is their chart. Y'all ready for this? David Cohen. David Cohen is the vice president for university labor relations. He's actually sit at the table with if you've gone to bargaining. If you haven't gone to bargaining, you should go just so you can see the nonsense that we're up against. It's not even really bargaining. That's not the right word for it. And it's just kind of interesting that he's not on the chart. That's all. I, it's just a question. Just a question for future research. Did you have? We weren't going to, but is it like a very tiny, brief, clarifying question? Who appointed him? I mean, he's been here since Barchi. I don't know if anyone in the room knows how far back David Cohen goes. Do we have any folks with that level of knowledge? Yeah, how many promoted him to this role? Like he was the chief negotiator under Barchi too, right? Yeah. So I got promoted. Got a, a raise. Good. Uh, Chris H. failed to get appointed a judge. Oh, okay. All right. All the dirt. Sexual harassment. You can repeat that. The sexual harassment claim against him? Uh, he ignored a sexual harassment claim. So you get promoted. You get promoted. 
All right, this is the number one question we always get asked and you're gonna get asked and you need to be prepared to answer. How is Rutgers supposed to pay its workers? They are already putting, they're, they're going around shopping their propaganda to all the schools about how they have a shortfall and they don't have money. We have a whole team of people that research this. They have tons of money. Every year they say there's a hypothetical shortfall and then at the end of the year, magically, oh, they balance the books, amazing. So we know that their revenues have more than rebounded from the pandemic. They made money during the pandemic, like so many other corporations did. Their reserves have rebounded. This is their savings account. They called it a rainy day fund in our last negotiations during the pandemic, not rainy enough. They refused to spend any of their savings during the pandemic on workers' needs, on staff needs. What are they doing with the money? They're increasing the number of managers. They're giving managers promotions and bonuses, and they're cutting staff and instructors. That's what they're doing with the money. And they're also heavily subsidizing athletics. We've all heard about this. And, and there's no knock on sports. I like sports. But what's crazy is their, their budget model called responsibility center management they force the academic units to balance their budget. So it's like, listen, if you don't have it, you got to cut instructors, you got to cut TAGA lines. But the, the athletics program, they can run endless deficit. The athletics program doesn't have to cut anything. So it's all right. You want to have a sports program, fine, but don't treat it better than your instructional program. And that's what Rutgers is doing. So where do we come in? We have power here. We have our labor power, all of us. That's teaching, learning, field and lab work, administrative work, dining, custodial maintenance, the reading we do, the writing we do, our community engagement. This is all labor. And it was brought up earlier how we often aren't educated to think of it as labor, especially students, right? This is just something we're doing in the interest of our future. It's labor, it's all labor. And that's the labor that creates value for the university. Without our labor, the administration has no purpose. The university has no value. Management told us to stay home today. We're here, we're running it. Student solidarity, so important, so exciting how many of y'all are here. Your working, our working conditions are your learning conditions. This has become a common trope of educator labor, which is great, but what does that really mean? Without fair pay and job security, instructors and staff are overworked. It's harder for students to access the administrative support they need, to access folks for office hours, recommendation letters, future mentorship. You don't know if your teachers are gonna be around next semester, right. right? And you don't know if you can really afford to go to grad school. If that's in your future, you got, you know, you're looking in the mirror here and we're unhappy. We're having a good time. <laughs> we're having a good time today. <laughs> uh, without faculty and worker governance, the university continues to run itself for profit. They cut classes because they're under-enrolled, even if that's a class you've been waiting for for years to take, right? And they raise tuition while they pocket millions. And without campus equity, especially students here in Newark and in Camden have access to fewer resources than our comrades in New Brunswick. And that's not New Brunswick people's fault but that's what it is. And we all need to fight together for equal resources across all three campuses. Okay. So if you went to strike school, you went through this whole ladder. We talked about why pay dues, why sign petitions, why go to bargaining, why wear shirts and canvas and all that stuff. But you know what? We're, we're getting to the end. So we're here to talk about one type of action and one type of action only, and that is withholding our labor that is going on strike. All right, just a couple legal notes, because I know people are going to want to know we have an entire FAQ about this, which you should all have access to already, or we can get it to if you don't. But in brief, there is no state statute or law that prohibits strikes or work stoppages by public employees in the state of New Jersey. There's a law in New York City called the Taylor Law that does prohibit public employee strikes. 
Let me tell you, because I write about this, they go on strike all the time anyway. If your strike is big enough, then you win. Uh, so we don't have to worry about it. Uh, there's been at least 36 public employee strikes in New Jersey in the past 30 years. The university can petition for an injunction, and then a judge could say, y'all have to go back to work, and we can decide then what we want to do about it. Yeah, probably, right? Uh, and we are starting strike funds so that if they do withhold, withhold wages, we will try to make sure that people can pay their bills, they can make ends meet. We cannot promise that wages will not be withheld, but we're in a very different situation than Temple. We are not 700 grad workers. We are 8,000 workers across all job categories. And I don't know about you, but if they start withholding full-time faculty wages, I think people are gonna get real pissed. So nonetheless, there will be strike funds and we will, people will be donating to them and whatnot. So without further ado, so without further ado, this is what we're fighting for. We'll just leave it up in the background so it gets seared into your mind. And I'm going to wel welcome up Dr. Wendell Marsh, our moderator for today, to get into it. Hello, hello, hello. Um, so I'm going to be joined by the panelists today. Uh, so come, come on up. Uh, as, as they're coming up here, uh, I just want us to just take a moment to appreciate the space and the moment that we have. You know, uh, the administration uh, really did us a favor of letting us know that uh, when we want and we need, everything goes on hold. We need to do the work that we need to do. And we have the opportunity and the power to do it. So that's what this space is right now. Um, so today, this conversation uh, is really about thinking, what does the strike look like for us in this institution? Uh, we, we will kind of start this conversation. We have a few questions in mind, but what I want to emphasize is that uh, we are thinking together, right? This is gonna be very much a conversation. We want to uh, really uh, imagine and think creatively about the possibilities of this uh, strike. And so, you know, in general, you know, we often think of strikes as moments of di uh, disruption where we withhold our labor. It absolutely is that, right? We are considering how to do that. But also, I want to insist that it is a creative moment, right? It is a creative moment where we make the world that we want to live in, right? Where we make the university that we're, where we want to learn and teach, right? And so it is a, a, a space and a moment for experimentation, for possibility, right? And already the administration has uh, decided to help us, right? By making the conditions where we are taking the time to do this, right? By, uh, you know, putting classes on Zoom today. Right. This is just a glimpse of the creativity that's possible when we get together. So, without uh, further ado, we have uh, Caitlin Dudek, who's a part-time lecturer in the writing program. Uh, we also have Joshua Kiswerter, who's uh, coming from the New School and who's a PhD PhD student here, but a part-time lecturer at the New School. Uh, we also have uh, Ravi Mill, who is a research associate faculty in neuroscience. And we have Jacob Horan, right, an undergraduate student with us. And about if for those of us with certain experience what that was like and also 
how do we envision uh, withholding labor, right? And that's where things get really creative, and that's where I look forward to the interaction here. So first, let's go with this uh, first question, and perhaps we'll start with Caitlin, right? Uh, what does your labor look like, both recognized and unrecognized, right, at uh, this university in a typical week? Sure. Um, is this on? Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm a PTL part-time lecturer in the writing program here at Newark, um, and I've been doing that for about four years. Before that, um, I came back to grad school here at Rutgers in the MFA program. Shout out to all. Um, so, um, in a, a, I usually teach either two or three classes, um, each that are supposed to be capped at 20 students, though, um, because they're intensive writing classes, though in the fall, each of my classes I had three, um, were actually over that at 23, 24, 25 students. Um, and uh, we hold two classes a week, and we are uh, required to assign seven essays uh, throughout the course of the semester, and every Rutgers student has to go through these classes. Um, so they are very rigorous and intense classes, and difficult classes for the students, um, and I empathize with them for that. Um, in addition, we have office hours, I write recommendation letters to students, for students, I um, direct them, because we're first contact for a lot of uh, freshmen, I direct them to things like disability services for those who need accommodations um, and don't know that they are available to them, and school counseling services, particularly during the pandemic, was referring a lot of students to that and our newer care team. So in a way, um, <laughs> because it's a required class, everyone has to take it. Um, and we are closer to our students than many of the freshman classes, which are, which are bigger. Um, there's a lot of um, working with students in understanding what it means to be a student and what they deserve and what they deserve to get out of their tuition, in addition to what they um, do as a, their work as a student. So that is basically <laughs> uh, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. That's a lot of work, a lot of labor. <laughs> Uh, I mean, so on this theme of uh, how you work with students, maybe we could uh, transition to D David. Uh, what does your work as an undergraduate here look like? So, as students, it's like twofold, right? On one hand, we do the work professors give us. Thank you very much. <laughs> By doing that work, we get a degree. By getting that degree, we go out into the world and say, hey, look, I'm a Rutgers student. Are we fantastic? Are we great? Are we intelligent? Right? <laughs> this boosts the university's reputation. Right? You'll notice at the business school, you'll notice that the business school is the top rated school in uh, the Northeast, number one rated business school. They got that rating by rehiring former graduates at the business school. <laughs> at the same time, students provide a very key resource to the university. Students, take a guess. What's that resource we provide? Tuition. Tuition. Fantastic. For Newark students in particular, we're worth $288 million to this university. New Brunswick students, you're worth $723 million to the university. That's what we bring. We bring our money and we bring ourselves. Does that answer your question? That answers it very well, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. So Joshua, in, in a given week, what does your labor look like? What does your work look like? Yeah, um, is this on, right? Hello? Yeah. Um, I'm a first year PhD student here at Rutgers, so I'm actually quite new to this community, and it's actually like really lovely to feel all the kind of love and solidarity in this room right now. Actually, this is the first year PhD student. Welcome to Rutgers! Classes and reading until my brain is bleeding uh, is usually, um, you know, I have a TAGA and actually that's my classification here at Rutgers. Currently, as a first year student, I'm a research assistant for a professor, um, so a lot of my labor kind of outside of just attending classes and classwork involves um, research and field work in particular. Um, the, the project that I'm working on, which is actually a really, really super interesting, lovely project. Um, Involves a lot of interviewing people in uh, 
in New York City, uh, in addition to a lot of sort of like background literature reviews. So like, you know, generally like sort of contract stipulates, and I think the person I'm working with is really good at kind of adhering to this. Generally, like extremely about 10 to 15 hours um, of work as an RA per week. Um, it's worth noting that you know, as already kind of mentioned, uh, I'm also a part-time faculty member of the new school. I'm not teaching this semester. I taught last semester, um, but I think as worth mentioning that I have felt compelled for various reasons to seek work outside of uh, being a full-time PhD student. Um, that actually includes not just the use for teaching that I do at the new school, um, but also for sort of freelance editorial work that I do on the side. So I am one of those kind of like people who juggles a lot of things, um, probably too many things <laughs> sometimes. Um, and so I think for me, like the stakes of, uh, of you know what we're talking about today is actually very meaningful because it would be nice to maybe take one or two of those extra things off my plate every once in a while um, and be able to rely a little, rely a little bit more on um, what I'm making here. So it's not true that as a, a grad student, all you have to do is, is your uh, coursework or <laughs> you actually have Sorry, Frank, a to support. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's not just like you know, sitting on the beach reading. Uh, <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of reading. I mean, I, you know, that's, that's uh, you know. But I think you know, something that Aaron mentioned earlier that I wanted to repeat is that like research is work, right? And I think like we're often kind of, uh, I don't know, it's sort of drilled into our brains that like this is like a luxury that we you know, are like creating this knowledge, right? Um, it's work. It's work. You know, even like reading and writing is work. Field work is definitely work. Um, so I just want to emphasize that. Thank you, Rafi. Um, so I work at a research intensive STEM department. Um, we have working there for almost nine years, which is kind of strange to think about. <laughs> Given the best years of my life to Rutgers. <laughs> <laughs> my youth, my accent. <laughs> <laughs> but what that looks like, so I started off as a postdoc, five years of that, and I've been a research associate for the last four. Um, and most of my tasks roll around research, and as you said, the recognized role that I have is research. So, you know, the kind of nerd shit, you know, like, <laughs> like data for experiments, analyzing them, writing them up for peer review uh, publication. And a critical part of that is securing external grant funds. Yeah. That's something that I spend an inordinate amount of time doing. And how that basically works is like working on commission. Like, as you're actually doing the research, you know, the work, Alongside that, you have to figure out ways to generate the funds to continue your job, to secure your job. And for people like me in a non-tenure track role for postdocs, for grad students, that's something you have to do for eternity, basically, the way things are set up now. Um, and that brings money into the university, you know, lots of, you know, million dollar grants, whatever. Um, and we don't really get treated with the kind of like equity of what we bring. So that's recognized stuff. Unrecognized is mentorship. So any research assistants in our lab, be they undergrads or new grad students, postdocs, uh, we have to provide one-on-one -on -one supervision and mentorship to them. That's unrecognized, that's just something that we have to do. Uh, and we enjoy doing it, but it's just not reflected in our pay or our job title or our, or our security. Um, and I also have a role in teaching some grad level um, classes. So as, as far as teaching undergrads, I don't do um, a lot of that, but I do mentorship, I do research, I bring external grant funds into the university. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what I do. Yeah, okay, so we've heard uh, instruction, we've heard, thank you, yeah, thank you all. Uh, instruction, grading, we've heard uh, tuition, we've heard uh, you know, reputation, uh, we've heard uh, grant writing, uh, you know, there are a whole lot of different ways we have to work to keep this institution running, right? Uh, of course, mentorship, this is uh, a big, often underrecognized, especially by women, especially by people of color, the demands that are kind of um, implicitly or sometimes explicitly asked of us. 
right, um, are all ways that we work and perform uh, labor, right? Um, I guess now, if for those of us in uh, Joshua, uh, you have experienced a strike. Uh, I have some experiences as well. Uh, perhaps we could talk a little bit about uh, what that experience was like in this kind of university context. So if you could say what the strike was and, and what your experience was like. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay, so I'm going to try to not spend like too much time describing all this because it was like, it first of all happened very recently. So I went on strike as a new school adjunct starting in mid November. A week after I got married, by the way, that's a fun show. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, uh, and it lasted for five weeks. Uh, as the hand. <laughs> and it lasted for a long time. In fact, actually, um, to our knowledge, to our union's knowledge, our union being UAW Local 7902, um, it was the longest adjunct strike in US history, maybe. Oh, nice. like, yeah. like, I don't know, like, super verified that, but it's like, you know, with our best knowledge, it was the longest adjunct strike. Um, and yeah, it finally sort of was resolved in our favor. We won most of what we demanded. Uh, the very last week of the semester in December. Um, and I should say that first of all, like, you know, I noticed that in my infographic that sort of mentioned like new schools on the strike for five weeks, right above it. Uh, there was a line with NYU. NYU and the new school adjuncts belong to the same union, actually. And they had their health their strike authorization vote like a week or two before we held ours. And when we saw that they, you know, held their strike authorization vote, which was like a great show of power, right? I think it's one of the values of just that in and of itself, right? Is that like, you know, enough people vote, sort of should say like, okay, this is what like we're willing to do as a union. That's a great show of power. And immediately, you know, like very quickly, at least, I think in like 24 hours, like the NYU administration basically kind of caved to the demand of the union. And we had some hope that, like, oh, maybe it will be that way for us, which it wasn't at all. Um, it was the exact opposite experience. You know, we, we encountered a university that within a week of going on strike tried to put forth a quote unquote final, uh, it's like some very specific legal language. That's been fine best final offer, something like that, right? Which is basically a tactic that was used to walk away from the bargaining table and unilaterally impose a new contract, um, which then we had to vote on as a, as a union. Fortunately, 95% of us voted to thoroughly reject that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, I won't lie, the kind of intense about the situation was that the new school administration, in addition to just really stonewalling our bargaining committee at the, at the negotiations, was just like really and vocally and publicly kind of trying to not only just bust our union, but like basically like blame what we were doing, like trying to convince students that like we were sort of the reason why like their entire semester was being disrupted, right? Um, and fortunately, the students at our university like did not buy that for one <laughs> second. Uh, there was a great deal of uh, student factory solidarity that I think was actually very, quite crucial, and I was actually eventually winning. We can talk about that at some point. Um, but you know, in terms of the day to day, uh, I you know would go to the picket line as much as I could because I had come out here. Uh, you know, several days a week to go to class as a PhD student. And, you know, I was usually there like maybe one or two days a week. I was also able to do remote strike work, which was kind of fun. Um, and then uh, basically they had a system in place where if you were not able to actually physically attend the picket line, or if you, for some reason, like felt uncomfortable doing so, there were other sort of ways to contribute to the strike. One of those was um, kind of helping do like online communications work. So I was like helping select photos for the union's Instagram account, which was really fun. Um, in addition to just, you know, actually being out of the line and, you know, walking with a sign, chanting, you know, trying to just keep that energy up. And, you know, um, the last, I think the final week of the strike was the most intense because when the week began, uh, you know, we had just encountered, like, a really sort of a special barrage of 
kind of uh, anti-union rhetoric from the university, our provost had kind of infamously like invoked bell hooks uh, in an email that um, was also disparag further disparaging the union strike and kind of convinced students that what we were doing was like going to like potentially threaten like of all things, you know, like not just like their ability to like graduate, but like some international students ability to, you know, stay in the country, et cetera, which is all total bullshit, by the way. Um, uh, I was, you know, when we started that, we convinced that it was going to go on for like a really, really long time. And after a few days, things really started to turn. Uh, I think two things were really key. Um, well, three things. One was that, you know, there was increasing media coverage of what we were doing, getting a lot of attention nationally, and that really helped our cause. Two, there was a class action lawsuit that was filed by parents of undergrads. Um, and three, the students actually ended up occupying the new school's university center. And once that happened within, yeah, so once that happened within 24 hours, the university was back in the negotiations. And within three days, we had basically won our contract. So, Yeah, but it's, this is great testimony and it's proof of what uh, kind of showing our power and performing it can do. Uh, I'll just share briefly. So in 2018, I was a graduate student at Columbia University, and we went on strike. Um, I was very much just rank and file, so a lot of the details seem a bit hazy to me now. But uh, I know there are people in the room who could uh, expound on that. If you want to think of that as a case study, we have Dominic here, who's currently with. Uh, the grad student union, UAW, uh, who can maybe help us out with that. Uh, but what I want to share about that experience uh, was that what I remember most about it was that it was fun. <laughs> it was actually really fun to um, momentarily suspend our kind of everyday functions, responsibilities, and start to interact with people as people. Right, like we, uh, in the university, we have different roles and we're doing different things and we're often very kind of narrowly focused on, you know, a very small research question or kind of making sure we're, uh, you know, kind of fulfilling our task as instructors, right? And this was an opportunity in a moment where you saw people doing other kinds of things, right, whether it was uh, kind of organizing food, right, and making sure everyone had food to eat and taking care of each other, or playing instruments, right, um, and we held that picket all day, every day, uh, for, was, I think it was a few weeks, I, like I said, the details are, I mean, two weeks, um, some of the details are foggy now, but what, what I remember most was just that uh, people came out, uh, there was solidarity from other unions, uh, and there was a lot of energy, and it was a moment of great pride uh, of, and just hopefulness that we could actually uh, make the university in the way that we wanted. And so uh, that's something that I carry with me now, and something that I hope for us, that you know, if the administration continues uh, to refuse to give us a fair contract, that we can take it as an opportunity. Uh, to uh, kind of create and to actually dream and imagine together. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get kind of open up a little bit. I'm sure there are other people with strike experiences in the room that uh, it would be great to hear as well. Uh, but before we do, just one more question before we really open up and really get the conversation going. And this is the critical question and the creative question. How do you envision withholding your labor uh, for the impending strike? Right? How do you envision withholding your labor for the impending strike? And just as a way to take advantage of my privileges as the moderator, uh, a question that I've been sitting with, and I think it's an important one because it's, it's important for everyone. So I'm a tenure track uh, faculty member. I'm on sabbatical this semester. 
And this is a time when, you know, I'm supposed to be really just focused on get as much research as I possibly can so that, you know, when I go up for tenure, everything will be a go and I'll have job security, right? And so thinking about a strike in this moment for me, it's like, okay, how do I uh, kind of show up and support, be present uh, in this moment that's supposed to be kind of my time for concentrated research, right? Well, one thing that I want to point out is that uh, this is a part of the head game, right? That this is a kind of an ideological moment as well, right? One thing like the promise of tenure is absolutely a security for those who can get it, and it's, it's kind of a, a point of leverage that can make us exploit ourselves, right? right? And whether we call it, uh, you know, the, the corporate university, whether we call it the culture of side hustles, whether we call it uh, neoliberalism, whether we call it, you know, the economic system that privileges profit over people, whatever we call it, more and more, we are being delegated, especially in kind of the knowledge economy, knowledge worker, we're being delegated the responsibility to exploit ourselves, right? And so we need to think about to what extent are we participating in that, right? For an aspiration of tenure, for an aspiration of a tenure track job, for the aspiration of a PhD, right? Because like it never stops, right? And it's a part of the hamster wheel and what we have here is an opportunity to actually make, make it stop, even for just a moment, to ask some of these questions, right? So uh, yes, research as an academic is your interest, is in your interest, it is your, you know, it's to advance your career, but also know uh, that's a part of the head game. That's a part of the head thing, right? And if there is a strike, you know, um, that needs to be put on hold as well, right? And how we do that, I think is a conversation for us to have, right? I remember at a strike school a few months ago, uh, at the very least, you know, we need a uh, email message, uh, the away message saying, you know, we're on strike, because we all know uh, work more and more is simply responding to emails. <laughs> right, like that is work in the 21st century. Uh, but I think all of these uh, facets, all of these things we can think about, um, even those things that are obviously in our benefit, we need to pause and think about, okay, actually maybe uh, they're not as much in my direct benefit uh, in, a, um, in a kind of uh, unequivocal way, right? Even, even those things, like finishing your dissertation, like, is on the table. We need to think about and consider uh, if it comes to a strike, if uh, the administration forces us to put our work on hold. Because that's what we're talking about, right? That after 10 months, we're put in a place where the, the work that is in our interest for our well-being, for our careers, has to be put on hold because uh, they're refusing to give us conditions to do that work well. That's the conversation we're having. So, Caitlin, what does that uh, look like for you? Yeah, so it's funny. I'm relatively new to uni work in general, and then also this will, if we go on strike, this will be my first time participating in a strike, which I'm very excited to see how When I graduated from the MFA, I considered myself, and I still do consider myself, first and foremost, a writer. And so none of this sort of comes very naturally to me. But um, uh, I, I took the, I continued working as a PTL because the job offered a, a certain amount of flexibility while maintaining, um, you know, a, a not great standard of living, but, a, but a, a way to pay the rent while I was finishing uh, my book. Um, and I think that 
I always thought, like, well, I'm not really necessarily part of the academy. I'm just here to get a paycheck while I work on my actual work, um, which is what your story sort of made me think about. And I, I have realized since that um, whatever I am, I am a worker. And I... <laughs> recognition, the compensation that we deserve. Uh, for PTLs specifically, uh, it's a very tough ask uh, for many of us. Many of us have several jobs. Um, we have no job security whatsoever. There is nothing stopping any, uh, anyone from not rehiring us to teach next semester. Um, so many of the PTLs I've spoken to are very hesitant to go on strike. Many of them have full-time jobs and they're just doing this to help make ends meet or, you know, because they, they need to pick up a class on the side um, because they like teaching. Um, so we are probably in some of the most precarious positions of anyone here. And so knowing that we have the support of all the people in this room, of all the um, of the full-time faculty, of the grad students, um, of the fellows, of everyone uh, that's here has been really heartening. And I think that for um, when we go on strike, um, it will look different. It'll look a little bit different because many of us have other jobs that we have to go to. Um, but um, my hope for PTLs is that they too can find it uh, find courage in the solidarity that's been expressed here today and also withhold their labor, uh, not teach their classes, not post a canvas, um, come out on the picket lines when they're able to, but also um, tell their students to join us too. Um, and that, that if we have better conditions, um, they'll have better conditions too, because we teach 30%. So uh, the question is, is, what will you withhold uh, pending a strike, right? Uh, and also, if maybe we'll add in this, what will you withhold and also what will you bring to, to a strike, right? What will you contribute and add in, in solidarity? Students, <coughs> I asked y'all what it is you provide for the university, right? Do you remember what your answer was? Tuition. Tuition money. What can we withhold from this university that they very desperately need to operate this university? Tuition! That's right. That's the ticket right there. And what can we bring, right? It was mentioned previously at the panel this morning that the biggest radical change on this campus came when students occupied this very building, Conklin Hall. time on Fridays. <laughs> That's what we can bring. We can bring ourselves and we can bring each other. Woo! Um, I just want to add to that, you know, kind of the funny thing about just any sort of neoliberal university, if you want to call that, call it that, and it's basically all of them at this point, that management does tend to uh, think of the students as kind of customer. So, you know, maybe leverage that and remind them that the customer's always right, right? Um, now, in terms of the, the question about like what does withholding labor look like for me, um, I mean, I kind of went through this last semester as a, as a teacher, and I can maybe just speak to that a little bit, um, which is withholding labor actually meant like really just not teaching. Uh, it meant keep not communicating with my students about classwork specifically. Um, that said, a lot of my students were also at the picket line, and I was talking to them like pretty regularly, actually. Um, and you know, we could talk about all sorts of other things, right, related to the strike. You know, like I kind of kept my like uh, channels of communication open for people if they like had any concerns about that, but also made it pretty clear, like, look, when it comes to classwork, 
we just bend the picture. I'm not working. I'm not working on that right now. We're we're all not working on this right now, right? Um, as a PhD student here, you know, like withholding labor would basically just mean kind of ceasing to do, you know, sort of the baseline kind of my the work that I get paid for, which is a research assistant. Um, you know, like that's unfortunate because I would really like that work, actually. I really do, you know, like, I want to keep doing it. Um, it would be probably, like, inconvenient in certain ways to stop it. But at the same time, I think, going to what you were speaking of, like, there's a lot of other, there's so much more that's at stake, right? Especially, kind of, as, for me, like, a first-year PhD student, and I should also mention, too, like, a first-year first part-time faculty. So I started teaching at the new school last semester. So I'm like new, new faculty, new adjunct, new PhD, like basically like new to kind of like a career in academia, if you will. And so actually for me personally, I feel like, you know, it's crazy to think about going on strike maybe twice in the first year that I've like retired to academia. But like, it's actually, I'm kind of in this fortunate position for that to be happening now at this stage of my career, because it's already elevating my own expectations for it, right? Like when I was, when I joined New School's adjunct, I didn't really have any like uh, illusions that it was anything more than like potentially a gig, and I use that word very deliberately. Yeah. Um, after that strike experience, I actually feel like more plugged into that community. I feel like I have a bit more job security potentially in the future. Um, it's like actually motivated me to like take it like my role in that institution more seriously. And I hope that that would be the case here at Rutgers as well, right? Um, yeah, for me, I just wanted to circle back to what you were saying, Wendell, about how, like, structurally, how the system that we work in is engineered, you know, to you know, make it precarious and insecure for people, you know, people like myself that have been doing this for years. Um, it makes the decision to strike that much harder because, you know, um, and I can add into the mix if you're here on a visa, if you don't have a status in the country, like, it just adds to that stress and precarity. Um, but what I realized anyway, and it's the same, and, and uh, this morning's panel and, and, and the protests and the speech is really um, handed at home, is that like, firstly we're part of a broader struggle. This thing with it being like, like toxic financial incentives, like governing how we live our lives is everywhere. And if you want to break the system or if you want to change the system, how do you do that? It's through labor, it's through uh, withholding your labor, it's through striking. So understanding that, <clears throat> excuse me, that this is a, a broader struggle that we're part of, that we are forced to live in these structures that are toxic and, you know, inhumane. And this is the way you break through it. And, and hopefully break through it in a way that can uh, uh, foster something new or something better. Um, so yeah, there's a wider struggle and it's a timeless uh, struggle too. Um, not to speak too kind of grandiosely, but like, for me anyway, it helps to kind of be mindful of that. Um, so that's the motivation to go on strike and how I rationalize doing it. What it would actually look like, yeah, I would withdraw from my mentorship, my teaching. <coughs> Um, I would stop working on grants, um, you know, stop trying to generate revenue for the university, you know, if they're not going to uh, respect that labor. Um, yeah, and, the, and, and you know, that is going to harm my own career, it's going to, you know, potentially impact on my status in this country or uh, uh, pursuing a more secure status. But we're part of a broader struggle and that is equal. You know, energizing and motivating. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say to that. So I mean, that's, that's really practical. So to sum up, you know, we're talking about um, uh, kind of withholding work we do for grants uh, around kind of classroom instruction, uh, potentially also uh, tuition and, and rent, etc. Right? Uh, there's a lot of different possibilities uh, that we have. Uh, I also want to um, point out something I heard kind of from Joshua was that um, you were still teaching 
right, in some ways, you were still kind of in this interaction with students, right, but what seems to have, have happened in the space of the strike is a shift in attention, right? And I, I think for me, that might be a really important way to think about what we would do in a given strike, right? It's not that we're not performing labors, right? But the attention and quality of our labors are shifted, it's redirected, and it's the intention um, would be different, right? The intention would be about creating uh, a university that's for us, uh, a university uh, that we want to be in, right? Uh, so with all that in, in mind, you want to follow I want to jump in with something on that front where you say education change direction, right? Uh, when it comes to students, how many of y'all have jobs outside of your job as a student? Okay, okay. You want to talk about transferable skills? Learn how to organize and operate a strike is the most highly transferable skill. <laughs> Got high energy, it's been a great day. Uh, we want to hear from you all. 